But to your point around growing the, the plants in a stress condition, so it's there's a lot of research on that around uh, red wine and how um, res the resveratrol concentration of it is affected by growing it under stress and um, chlorogenic acid is, is really the, the resveratrol of coffee and there is some research which shows that coffee grown at altitude because of the extra stress in the thinner air etc um, leads to a higher concentration of chlorogenic acid in the original bean so that's another thing that we tested as well. Doctor's Kitchen Recipes, health, lifestyle. Guys, thank you so much, Alex and Al. I know you both called Alex, I'm gonna call one of you Al, which is the founder, Al, and Alex Manos, who is, what, what is your role, uh, Alex? You're, you're the medical advisor, but you, your background is, um, it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so I guess my official title is the Chief Wellness Officer. Um, so I, uh, I help out with the, the content, um, especially from a health perspective. So. Uh, me and Al go back a few years now. Um, but yeah, my role is to help and assist in things like the blogs that go out, the science section on the Excel webpage. Um, I obviously join Al for the podcast. So we have good chats uh, with people about coffee, which is lots of fun. Um, and my background is initially started in personal training and, and massage therapy. Um, but because of my own health issues, um, I had ongoing digestive issues from a very young age. I was diagnosed with IBS finally when I was 18, um, went on to study nutritional therapy, partly just because of that sort of natural evolution. I really found that diet just played such a huge role in alleviating my gut symptoms. Mm. Um, and then as the whole sort of functional medicine movement came to the UK, started certifying with the Institute for Functional Medicine. Um, and I guess most recently I've done my master's in personalized nutrition. So I've kind of gone from the, the movement physical side more into the nutritional and functional nutrition side. Yeah, that's that's epic. It's it's it always um, it, it doesn't surprise me anymore that so many people have like a personal health story when it comes to how they got to nutrition. Yeah. Um, and it, I'd love to dive into some of the topics around uh, gut health, the impact of coffee on the gut, and um, whether that's having a positive or negative effect as well, depending on mm -hmm. the person. Um, but before we get into that, let, let, let's chat to Al, uh, the founder of, of XL Coffee, um, who I've known for uh, probably about a year now. We've been chatting um, and we met up a few times. Um, you've had your own health uh, story as well, I guess. Exactly. I mean, it's the classic of everybody who's got into a business like this, a health related business, had their own health story. But basically, before launching XL, I was an accountant for about 15 years working in FTSE 100 companies, very kind of very much in the corporate world, deeply unfulfilled accountant, um, totally the wrong career for me. And then I kind of was just plodding along. And then around six years ago, I started developing my own weird and debilitating health issues and getting loads of crazy symptoms from, you know, gut issues as well, but also the kind of the brain fog and the fatigue and all that kind of stuff. Mm. And I didn't realize at the time, but it turns out I was actually developing an autoimmune condition and it was literally affecting everything across my whole life from parenting to I had a baby around that time to work. I was getting into endurance sports. So it was just really stopping me enter so many events. Like I pulled out more than I actually entered. Um, and basically kind of I was in and out of most hospitals across London because of my symptoms. Um, and I was just hadn't got any answers. So I started trying to take control of my own health and just started researching more and more um, how I could kind of what I could change my lifestyle and what dietary changes and other lifestyle changes I could make to try and take back control of my health. And then the more I researched and the more I kind of tried to push the endurance and the, uh, the athletic kind of um, uh, challenges, which is kind of where I was getting the fulfillment from in life. And um, the more I came across coffee as being um, <clears throat> playing quite a pivotal part in both of those. And like on the endurance side, I obviously was using it for the performance benefits. Then on the health side, it just turns out from the research that it had, you could have such a profound impact on health as well. So then I was desperate to get out of accounting. So this kind of, this whole coffee idea and movement kind of sparked that transformation in me to finally have the, the courage and the motivation to get out of accounting and launch a business around kind of coffee for health and for performance, which is where Excel was born. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if anyone has ever met you, 
the uh, the thought of you being an accountant uh, is so far removed from what your day to day is like now, but also like your weekends. I mean, when you say you're an athlete and you're high performance, I, I think you're really underestimating it. Just for the listeners' sake, like you, you do ultra marathons. You, you're, you're probably about to tell me that you're doing some like crazy. 100k run this weekend or something like because every time we speak you're like oh yeah i'm doing this this weekend so you know no, having an, an ai condition would have really impacted that um totally. i guess yeah totally and like yeah i'm kind of training for a hunt my first 100 mile ultra at the there, you <laughs> there you go <laughs> so like for example yesterday i ran into the office but it, it was a three hour run into the office oh, um, my by way. a by a hill repeats on the steepest hills in London. So it's kind of a, yeah, that's my, that's my day-to-day life at the minute, really. <laughs> yeah. Well, you live and breathe uh, the brand, which is aspirational, um, but it's also, you know, about grounding uh, yourself with a, a delicious tasting, high quality coffee that's for performance, environmental benefits, um, and, uh, and, and just, you know, the, the pleasure and the flavor of having like an amazing cup of, uh, of, of coffee, the hot drink, my, my favorite drink. Um, so t- tell us a bit about like where the, the idea sort of, uh, generated and, and began to take shape because I think everyone has ideas, particularly if you're in a job, which is not fulfilling, or, you know, you've always wanted to move into some space that you have an interest in for a lot of people that is wellness. Where did you spot the gap uh, in in the in the market for a, a healthier coffee? Because I don't think most people people just think of coffee as coffee. You know, you've got yeah, different yeah. brands, you get different farms, you get you know single origin, et cetera, et cetera. But wh- where is where is the health aspect? Yeah, so I actually first decided I wanted to set up a coffee roastery about six years ago as well when I was traveling around Bali um, and I was surfing in Bali. We'd, we'd taken our baby during maternity leave, traveling for three months. And I was surfing every day, sleep deprived. And I was surfing some of the craziest waves in, in the world over kind of waist deep uh, waters over razor sharp coral and coming into like life or death situations. And I had really one really close uh, call. And then I kind of became slightly obsessed with coffee from that point because of how much it'd wake me up and of how it really helped my performance. And I could go from having a terrible night's sleep to, to go out and have one of the best serves of my life, but at the same time come back and then be a great parent still, and rather than just flying at half mass continually. And then as I started learning, well, basically as I started swapping more things in my life for more health conscious decisions and foods a few years later, and started realizing that actually there was no healthy coffee, but actually coffee could be one of the most um, beneficial, um, or it's up there with the most beneficial parts of a healthy lifestyle. It's up there. Um, that I realized that there was a gap in the market because there was nothing for me to swap my coffee to. But then there was all this science mountain supporting coffee as being a great health product. So that's mm-hmm. where the kind of the idea came from. And, and did you discuss that with Alex like, early on? And what, what, what is the, the relationship? Yeah. Would you go to school together or like, no, just, was like the best friends? When or... I was going through my health issues, Alex was my uh, functional medicine practitioner. Oh, he, was, gotcha. you know, he was guiding me through my health issues. And we had a chat around two and a half years ago, maybe. And I said to him, um, what are your views on coffee? And Alex thought I was asking, should I cut coffee out of my diet to help my health issues? And Alex actually said, Put it this way, I started drinking coffee for its health benefits. And that's when <laughs> I've been on this journey already thinking about healthy coffee. And I was like, well, actually, I've got this idea to launch a business around a healthy coffee. Do you want to join me on it? And he said, hell yeah. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. Yeah. That's epic. And so so where, so the, the health aspect of, of coffee, what, why were you convinced of that, Alex? What was, uh, mm. what, what was your introduction? Yeah, can I first say that, Al, you make my life sound so boring. <laughs> <laughs> he, makes, he makes everyone's life sound boring, honestly. Like, every time he chats, you know, he's either running <laughs> or, like, on the way to something, or he's telling me about something he's preparing for, which is, which is epic, but yeah. Yeah, but um, no, to answer the question, I think I just stumbled across a paper, basically, on PubMed that started discussing the health benefits. Um, and there's kind of a running joke, I think, in, in nutritional therapy, which is you start your first year as a student and you look in the lecture theatre and everyone's got their bottles of water um, or their green tea. But by third year, everyone's just looking exhausted back with the coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think there is this kind of 
there's it's easy to think that because of the caffeine and we're all stressed that we should be limiting our coffee and it's a guilty pleasure um but when i came across that paper i was like oh actually this is great news and i wasn't I wasn't even particularly fond of the taste at that time. So I started drinking it literally for the health benefits. I'd never drinking coffee before. So it wasn't like I was actually personally excluding it because I thought it was bad per se. Um, and then I've kind of, I guess my taste buds have evolved and now like the highlight of my day is my, my morning coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah. I, I, had, I had my own um, sort of... Uh, journey through coffee so i i didn't start off drinking coffee at, um at the start of university it was only until last year so probably similar to you guys uh i started when i was in my fourth or fifth year of medicine um and i started off like right at the bottom rung as you can imagine like this is probably going to like absolutely uh horrify a lot of the listeners but i was it was a mocha with extra cream <laughs> from uh, uh, Starbucks uh, and I would get like a large one as well. And that's that I would literally use it for the caffeine benefits because it would give me that perk, but then I would be right back there like three hours later needing another one. And so that was sort of like where I started on my, my coffee journey. And then uh, I like gradually went to different ones like lattes and black whites, gradually removing the sugar. And then when I, go, when I went to Sydney, I had my first flat white when I was out there in 2014. And that's when the penny dropped. It was like, this is what coffee is meant to taste like. It's incredible. And now I, my standard coffee is a, is a long black because I really love to taste every element of the actual raw product in there and all the, the complexity and the flavors. And it was similar to the cupping session that we did uh, out the other, the other week. That was, that was an amazing experience. The first time I've, I've done cupping. Oh, maybe you can explain what cupping is to, to the listeners because... Yeah, it was it was so, new for me and I, and I hadn't had that before cupping is i mean primarily it's a way to taste for defects in a coffee so in kind of average commodity level coffee you taste a cup of coffee to taste for default defects but there's a, a standard protocol that you have to follow so <clears throat> in the speciality coffee world cupping is really important because to be a speciality coffee you a coffee has to score over 80 out of 100 on the SEA scale for coffee. Okay, and there's this really strict protocol of how to brew that coffee, first of all, and then how to taste it and how to score it and what different things you're looking for when you're tasting it. So that in theory, someone could taste the same coffee anywhere in the globe from any country and from any background following any diet and they'd score it almost exactly the same out of 100. Mm. Um, irrespective of all of those different conditions and it's that strict a protocol and it does really work like that and it's actually it's a huge um it's a huge thing for the industry because a score of one or two difference could really impact the amount that's then paid to the farmer yeah. so if someone scores a coffee 79 and it's not quite speciality grade then the, the price that the farmer can sell it for is considerably less so it's a really strict kind of process as much fun as it is when we do it with all the slurping and everything else it's kind of it's actually really you take it very seriously you do it in like labs lit with uv red lights so you can't be impacted by the color of the coffee and all this oh my word yeah that's super cool yeah yeah well let's um let's bring it back to the the health benefits uh, of coffee because this is kind of where it all started and, and alex i want to bring you in here again um so let's take a, a macro approach about what we know about coffee and the impact of the consumption of coffee and the association with different conditions and, and how we might describe it as potentially preventative for certain things. What, what do we know about that level of evidence and, and, uh, and, and, and the associations with coffee? Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty incredible, really. So I think my favorite statistic is if you're a coffee drinker, especially if you're averaging three or four coffees a day, which seems to be generally the sweet spot in the research, um, there's a 10% excuse me, reduced risk in all-cause mortality, which basically just means if you drink that much coffee, you're 10% less likely to die from anything, um, which is just sort of a fun statistic, I think. Um, but we also see significant reductions in sort of cardiometabolic conditions. So type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome generally has a 9-10% reduced risk. Um, liver conditions is another one. So we see a 29% reduced risk in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, in the research, we'll probably come back to this because there's a really strong 
gut microbiome, gut integrity connection with kind of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But we also see almost a 40% reduced risk in liver cirrhosis. Um, we see significant reduced risks in liver cancer. Um, my second most favorite stat is around neurodegenerative stuff, because I think a lot of people are so scared that, that could be in their future. Um, I think there's, it kind of tugs on the heartstrings, I think, for a lot of us. And there's a 25% reduced risk of Parkinson's disease and a 65% reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and a lot of this research has pretty strongly suggested it's not just caffeinated coffee, that decaf coffee has very similar um, health benefits and protects mm. us at these sorts of magnitudes. Um, from a cardiovascular perspective, we see a 30% reduced risk of mortality by stroke, a 19% reduced risk of coronary heart disease. Um, and I think that covers kind of a lot of the big ones. Other cancers include prostate, endometrial, um, melanoma, mm. and there's a couple of others as well there. Um, so from an overarching perspective, we see significant reduced risk of a lot of different conditions, colon cancer being another one, actually. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, yeah, huge associations with uh, some of the, the, the most widely known and the most prevalent conditions that we have. Do we see any other associations with other uh, caffeinated and perhaps non-caffeinated drinks like uh, maybe tea or um, a green tea in particular, do, do, do we, is it comparable or is, or is there one better than the other? I'm just thinking about the non-coffee listeners here who, who perhaps can't have coffee for whatever reason. Uh, w would there be some, some comparable benefits? I couldn't say with 100% certainty. I know there's research out there that has compared it. And from memory, there are somewhat similar outcomes. Mm. Uh, and that's partly just because one of the things in coffee that is providing these health benefits is the polyphenols, which we'll mm. expand on later. And polyphenols are obviously found in things like tea and green tea, but also things like um, cocoa um, and you know various fruits and vegetables just at different levels, ultimately. So because these polyphenols are one of the primary um, mechanisms or constituents that's leading to these health benefits, we're definitely seeing some of that within um, sort of normal tea drinking and green tea as well, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Al, we had a chat actually, I remember one of the first times and um, you were kind of blown away by the concentration of different polyphenols that you have in coffee. So let's, let's go into that kind of detail uh, for a bit because uh, when I did a bit of research around coffee, I was kind of blown away. A, it's a significant contributor to our total polyphenol con uh, intake, particularly in the States. But B, just the magnitude of different types of, of polyphenols that you get uh, in coffee is, is pretty incredible. So we understand that there are some associations with coffee drinking and reduced all-cause mortality, plus a few other, um, or a bit more nuance to that statement as well. Let's go into, okay, what's in coffee from a, at, a, at a micro level in terms of those different polyphenols, which, what are the standout constituents? Yeah, so <clears throat> firstly, I'd say, going back to your, your original point, yeah, um, there are seven different studies, the first of which was a 2004 Norwegian study, which shows that coffee contributes on average 66% of your total dietary intake of um, polyphenols. Um, and then there's been six studies since then, which kind of confirm similar numbers. So coffee is the, the predominant source in our diets. Um, and those polyphenols in coffee, there's a specific one called chlorogenic acid, which is the kind of most abundant polyphenol in coffee. It's the one that most studies cite as being the one that's giving the health benefits of coffee. Um, and it also, in the, the green state of the coffee, in the green bean, it accounts for an average around seven or eight percent of the total weight of the bean. So it's a huge portion of the bean. Mm. And then as you roast the coffee, which we maybe we'll, we'll go into, um, that kind of drops as you go through the roasting process and the various stages of its life cycle. Now, aside from chlorogenic acid, there's a whole lot of other compounds. I mean, there's about a thousand different compounds in coffee overall. <laughs> there's loads of them and we're like continually discovering new ones in coffee that are associated with different health um, outcomes as well but aside from the the chlorogenic acid there's things called melanoidins which are formed mm -hmm. during the roasting process and they um they're particular uh, particularly relevant to the, the kind of the gut health side of the chat 
There's also things called cafestol and carweol, which have a lot of research behind them as well. They're two diterpenes, which are fat soluble associated with the, the fatty acids in coffee. Um, and yeah, there's loads of other things like lignans and, and then potentially some kind of negative compounds in coffee as well, which we want to try and avoid and roast out. So, so yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, there's just so much going on in there. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I mean, thousands of chemicals, yeah, the yeah. standard ones being your polyphenols for which you have your, your chlorogenic acids of which there are a variety of different ones. Yep. And I, I would love to go into a bit about the roasting process actually, and, and seeing how you can change that and the process that you went through to find your healthy coffee, uh, your, your diterpenes that you just mentioned there, um, which again have some potential mechanisms by which they might be uh, health promoting. And then your um, melanoidins, which I understand are products of the roasting process of the Maillard reaction. Exactly. Um, and and there is, oh, is it acrylamides? Is that the negative uh, chemical that you're referring to that we want to try and reduce? Exactly. Acrylamide is the negative one. Um, and yeah, the roasting process really impacts the levels of all of these different ones. So as I mentioned, chlorogenic acid starts in its highest concentration in the green bean. And then as you roast it, it slowly drops off. And then somewhere around a medium to dark roast, it drops off a cliff. Yeah. And then as you get to a dark roast, you kind of lost 90% of the original concentration of chlorogenic acid. So you want to avoid dark, really dark roasted coffees. Then the melanoidins are formed during the Maillard reaction, um, which is the caramelization of the sugars in the coffee, which peak at around a medium roast. And then they start dropping off again towards the dark roast. And then the Cafston Cowriol are also... Um, they peak around a medium. So they start in the highest concentration in the original green state of the coffee. And then as you roast it dark, they, um, cause they're associated with the, the oils in the coffee, the fatty mm. acids. When you roast a dark coffee, when you see the surface of the bean being shiny with the oils, that's the oils leaving the coffee bean, taking with it these um, cafston and carriol compounds that are, that are um, within the oils. So mm. again, you kind of want to avoid the dark roast coffees but you want to develop the coffee far enough into a medium roast to get the benefits of the melanoidins. Yeah, so it's yeah. a balancing act between all of these different compounds, really. Well, I was going to go into the mechanisms behind the benefits, but let's talk about the process because I think we're at a good point there because and in your story, okay, you, you've got uh, your, your practitioner who's now your friend and, and, uh, and involved in the business. Um, where, did you, where did you even start? like trying to yeah. think about, okay, what bean am I going to use? Who am I going to use to import it? What, talk us through that, that whole process. Yeah, so fortunately, there's a lot of studies done on coffee. So in the last 10 years alone, there's been over 8,000 studies on coffee. So it took me around two years of research and reading the science on coffee to try and figure out and come up with this theory. And then basically at the start of 2020, around about the time lockdown started, I kicked off this process and I got 45 coffees from plantations all around the globe that met a certain criteria that I knew would lend themselves to higher concentrations of polyphenols. Mm -hmm. So we had these 45 coffees, we had this great day in our garden, cupping the 45 coffees, we taste tested them all, chose our favorite tasting ones of them and then sent them off to be lab tested. And then we found, we chose the coffee that- the Hold on, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna ask, how, how did you, what was the criteria for, that, that you used to get those 45? So they had to be organic farmed to okay. start with. Okay, and then there's other parts of the process which would lend themselves to a high concentration. So for example, coffees, you fully are aware can be, there's a few different processes like a washed or a natural process, uh -huh. most of them are. If you do a natural processed coffee, then it's left out on drying beds under the sun to dry for longer. So the UV okay. rays of the sun can degrade some of the polyphenols and affect the, the quantity that you're getting in the final cup. So we only went for washed processed coffees. Um, and then there's other processes around the decaffeination of it. And because we were looking for a decaf coffee as well, we wanted to use uh -huh. a chemical free decaf method. Um, and then people had said things like the there's loads of theories, loads of theories in the science, you know, that and different varietals of coffee would be better than others. And also robusta beans versus Arabica beans. And um, so we really just tested a real broad range of, of coffees that kind of met these different criteria, just to kind of get an understanding ourselves for it. So, so the criteria was, had to be organic. Yep. Had to be washed. Remind me what washes, I don't know if you explain that. What, what, what is washed again? 
So it's a process of how you, so, so coffee grows inside a cherry on a tree. Mm. And it's the process through which you get the, the coffee seed or the coffee bean out of that cherry. And okay. you ferment the coffee um, cherry um, and then the beans drop to the, the bottom or, or vice versa. Um, and that's how you remove the mucilage and the cherry from the coffee bean. And then the washed versus, versus natural depends on how they're dried. And the natural ones are just left on drying beds for a lot longer. The washed ones are kind of are washed and then dried in machinery, basically. Gotcha. Okay, fine. So, uh, because I, I think for a lot of people, when they see on the front of, especially like these third wave coffee packs, yeah, yeah. It, it just, it, nothing makes sense. You know, what, what is washed? What is, you know, th this method? Like, it's, it's very confusing. So this is great. So, so you went for an organic, Organic you washed. washed. Yeah. You went yeah. for robusta arabica. Um, so we tested a couple of robusta beans, um, but mainly arabica beans because robusta beans generally don't taste as good. So if mm. you're going for a single origin robusta, it's just so hard. There really aren't many. Although there's a bit mm. of a new wave, and they're actually they're more sustainable. So there's a new wave to try and get better quality robustas. But we went mainly arabicas. But we tested a few robustas, and they didn't seem to have much more. Um, they, they weren't any better than the Arabicas, the ones we tested. Oh, okay, about. okay, good. So you, um, went, you went for Arabica. Also, then... it had to be speciality grade was a key as well. So speciality okay. grade coffees are really like the coffees, to, to be speciality grade, it has to be free from defects, okay? Mm -hmm. So they, they judge the amount of defects in the coffee. And if you have a def defect in the coffee, like broken coffee beans, or oh, these are the things, it can really affect how they're roasted and introduce negative compounds into it. Um, and also it's really looked after at the farm. So, they, so they're kind of using that organic fertilizer and that kind of thing. And also looking after the crops means that speciality grade coffees often grown at higher altitude tend to have higher concentrations of polyphen polyphenols in them. Ah, so interesting. It's like any food, better looked after food. Um, yeah. If you have a farm and a plantation and it's fed with kind of like a, you know, um, not a, a monoculture plantation, maybe permaculture or something like that, you're yeah. going to get a lot more nutrients absorbed yeah. within what, all of those crops in the farm. So that was kind of the theory that we applied as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I want to take people through this thought process because there's so much that you've gone into it <laughs> and, and and otherwise it like, you know, it kind of just gets brushed over. So you went for all these different criteria. And it's interesting you said that about the, the defects in coffee beans, because... Mm. When I think about vegetables and wonky veg and imperfect veg, those are great because yeah. the imperfections have shown that they've had they've been stressed and you actually get those uh, an increased concentration of those different plant chemicals. Whereas with a bean, as you've nicely explained, it has to be a good uh, shape and size because that affects the roasting process. I, I wouldn't have put that together. So that's no, a really, so you want really the, nice you want point. The, you want the bean to roast in a really even way. So all mm. of the beans in the roast are roasted to the same level. That's the only way you can guarantee a kind of more even flavor profile and also on the, the polyphenol side. But to your point around growing the, the plants in a stress condition. So it's there's a lot of research on that around uh, red wine and how um, the resveratrol concentration of it is affected by growing it under mm. stress. And um, chlorogenic acid is, is really the, the resveratrol of coffee. And there is some research which shows that coffee grown at altitude because of the extra stress in the thinner air, et cetera, um, leads to a higher concentration of chlorogenic acid in the original bean. So that's another thing that we tested as well. So, so, so you've got, uh, this is brilliant. So, <laughs> so you've got this, this high altitude, uh, high altitude farms. Yeah. so you've got yeah. like a high proportion of one of the key components that makes coffee so healthy in the first place. Exactly. Uh, and then, and so, and so, and so, you whittled that all down to forty-five different plantations. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There were the forty-five coffees that met all of the criteria that were available at the time. And, uh, and give, give us a global. give us an idea of how many how many different plantations there are, like in, <laughs> in the world. I mean, I don't know, hundreds of thousands. Okay, fine, sure. yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I thought, I thought well, as much, yeah. You know, even in Africa alone, you know, there's so many smallholders plantations that are no bigger than your average garden in, in England, you know, probably. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot out there. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so that was the whole sourcing process. And then around roasting, it's even more complex because the kind of the roasting of the coffee really affects how... Um, yeah, the, like I mentioned before, so like once we'd found this coffee that had the highest inherent potential, we had to roast it loads of different ways at the roastery and plotted them on a graph to see where this drop off point was. 
mm. to see where the chlorogenic acid, which was slowly dropping, would then drop off a cliff. So we wanted to roast it kind of as far into the roast process as possible to develop that natural sweetness and the sugars in the coffee, the mylad reaction. But we didn't want it to pass this drop off point where you just, the, the, the concentration of the chlorogenic acid would start free falling, basically. So there's a real balancing out there, too. <laughs> This is brilliant because I, I can't imagine any other roaster really taking it to this level of thinking about not only the flavor, I think most of us in the same, in the same way a, a chef makes a meal, they're purely doing it for flavor. They're adding butter, they're adding cream, they're adding salt, they're adding MSG, they're adding all these different flavor enhancers to, to create a really palatable meal, which is beautiful and, and delicious. But th there is a balance. And I think there is a, what you're doing is essentially bringing the flavor aspect, but also concentrating on the functional benefits as well, which is, which is why I think we get on so well, because I, I'm trying to do yeah. that with food and you're, you're trying to do it with a coffee. I would um, say that as well as that as well, at every stage of our process, we considered the sustainability as well. So literally mm -hmm. when we got those original 45 coffees, we had a whole load of sustainability criteria that if they didn't meet it, we just didn't put them at the table. So there could in theory yeah. be a healthier coffee out there but it just maybe didn't taste good enough. Or also it just, you know, the farmer wasn't paid a fair price for the coffee and it didn't meet our sustainability criteria. So it was a real yeah. balancing act between all three of those. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember you actually explained, as a cupping day, you were explaining the differences between fair trade and actually what is a genuinely a fair price to the farmer and, and how, you, how you cater for that. I mean, you work really, really closely with your... Um, uh, uh, your, your importers uh, as well. I mean, you've got a great relationship with them. Maybe you could talk a bit more about that actually, because I don't think people fully appreciate the, um, the, the degree that you have to go to to actually ensure that your farmers are actually being paid properly. Um, it's not just the presence of a label, uh, actually that there's got to be a lot more thought process behind that. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's about choosing a reputable importer as well. Um, and we work with kind of one of the best in the in the industry and they go above and beyond supporting the farm and the plantation as well. Um, and yeah, the fair trade model is great. It doesn't really apply as much in the speciality world because the fair trade model guarantees a price. So uh, coffee is a, a commodity product. It's like a trading on the, the stock exchange like oil and uh, whatever else and gold. Um, so coffee is a commodity product. And as a result, the price of that coffee and then the price that gets paid to the farmer is so dependent on the stock market and these things that are out of their control. Yeah. So the fair trade certification is a really good way of guaranteeing a minimum price that farmers get paid for their coffee, um, which isn't reflected, which isn't affected by the, the, the stock exchange. And it, it works really well in general but it only really works at the commodity level um, coffees, so the cheaper coffees. Once you get into yeah, the speciality yeah. coffee world, the farmers are getting paid three, four, five, ten times as much as the fair trade price anyway. So they don't go through the fair trade certification because it's kind of the next level, which is where this scoring out of 100 is so important. Um, and if you score less than 80 and you're not speciality coffee, then it is a much more difficult process for them. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Alex, I'm going to bring you back in here because we've got to the point where uh, Al is roasting the coffee to make sure he's got all those beautiful polyphenols in. It tastes great. Uh, you're reducing the negative impacts of the of the Maillard effect of the roasting process. Let, let's go into some of the mechanisms behind why these polyphenols have benefits. There's only so much that we can tell, I guess, from in vivo and in vitro studies, but but maybe we can go through some of the hypotheses and, and, and the mechanisms. Yeah, so I think the, the short answer is that we see that these compounds have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. And as you say, we've got, we've got different layers of evidence. So the statistics we mentioned earlier around sort of the reduced risk of conditions through drinking coffee are largely from obviously epidemiological observational studies, um, but that's still valuable. So some mm. of the more recent studies, you know, they've tried to do their best to get rid of all the compounding factors like smoking, exercise, and things like this. And the sheer number of people over sometimes extended periods of time really 
um, strengthens those associations. So some of these studies are looking at 900,000, almost a million individuals. Um, the one around all cause mortality was half a million people in the UK. Um, and we see some of these associations in different ethnicities, cultures around the world as well, which I think is just an interesting kind of finding. Mm. Other, other research does have some conflict when we think about gender um, and ethnicity as well. So we have to be mindful of that, I guess, ultimately. But from an in vitro, in vivo, sort of test tube laboratory type analysis where we can start to look at these mechanisms, we do see a reduction in various pro-inflammatory mediators. So things like uh, interleukin-6, cytokines. Um, there are studies in humans that have shown a reduction in C-reactive protein, which is a well-known inflammatory marker in the blood. So there is some human research that's kind of correlated that as well. But actually one of the thing, two things that are really interesting, apart from just this antioxidant, anti-inflammatory perspective is um, the epigenetic mechanisms that can go on. And also what you guys have been discussing about around the environment and the climate that that coffee bean is grown in and the stress response leading to greater quantities of these phytochemicals. There's a theory which is the same as happening at a cellular level in the human, meaning that a lot of these polyphenols have a degree of toxicity associated with them. Like if you drink too much green tea, that can actually be quite problematic for your health. Um, so there's this idea that actually one of the mechanisms involved with coffee is that the polyphenols are stimulating something called NRF2. Mm. And when NRF2 is stimulated, that's then leading to this kind of adaptive um, cellular response whereby we're seeing an upregulation in endogenous antioxidant systems because bear in mind you know we talk about antioxidants from coffee or we talk about zinc selenium vitamin c but we have endogenous antioxidant molecules and systems and these are actually getting upregulated by not only chlorogenic acid but a lot of the other compounds that were mentioned earlier like the diterpenes um, and trigonaline as well um, so there's different mechanisms that are at play there. And then the epigenetic one, um, epigenetics I, th I think is basically kind of defined as above genetics. So when we're talking about epigenetics, we're talking about how our genes are being expressed. Um, the most researched mechanism is related to methylation. So with methylation, a methyl compound, which I can only describe as like a carbon hydrogen molecule, that's as best as I can go with it, um, is either added or removed um, to a certain segment of the DNA, which is then influencing genetic expression. So these genes are kind of being turned on or turned off is the, the common way it's described. So what research has shown through these kind of epigenome-wide association studies, is what they're called, is that chlorogenic acid and coffee seem to be influencing the methylation of these um, DNA strands and genes and that's having an impact on the integrity of our DNA, which is strongly associated with most health conditions, especially the ones that we've been discussing, cancer being probably the best example. So you've got kind of the easy idea of antioxidants, anti-inflammation, it's influencing genetic expression, and it's also inducing our own adaptive responses in the cell, um, which is very different to, I guess, some of the the stuff happening in the health space at the moment with the idea of removing plants because they're, they're toxic. Um, yeah. This kind of hormetic hormesis response, which is that the appropriate amount of a stress is, is important. Um, same principle for exercise, same principle for fasting, uh, same in, uh, principle for hot or cold therapy. You yeah. know, there's this amazing paper that came out a few years ago talking about acquired resilience. Um, like we have acquired immunity, you get exposed to a bug, the next time you're exposed, you've got a more efficient response. It's the same sort of principle. The more you expose yourself to these little micro stressors, the more adaptive we become, the more resilient we become. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I guess, an, an overview of these mechanisms. Yeah, I, I think you've explained that so eloquently and, and well. And uh, ju just to summarize for, for the listener, so you've got these different potential mechanisms, one of which it's quite easy to understand because I think we tend to talk about it in relation to uh, vitamin C containing green foods, for example, or 
fruits and vegetables in general, you have these direct antioxidant, anti-inflammatory activities. But what you've really well described is this concept of uh, plant hormesis or phytochemical hormesis, which is essentially like the analogy, a little bit of harm is good. Not too much harm, not too little harm, but that sweet spot. And uh, the upregulation of your innate cell defense mechanisms, which uh, is via the NRF2 pathway, which is, I don't want to get into the, the details of like uh, keep one and how that goes into, you know, into the nucleus and then you upregulate certain genes. But basically, um, if for the listener, if you could conceptualize the nerve pathways, this cascade of different processes that occur in response to stress. And that upregulates uh, your antioxidant and anti-inflammatory mechanisms, which has a net benefit to you, the host. And the analogy I was, I was actually explaining this to uh, my analyst yesterday. The analogy I love to use is the one that you just mentioned uh, of exercise. So when you exercise, that's innately a, a stressful condition, like what Al does every weekend is stressing his, his muscles to an nth degree. But the, the net impact of that is going to be resilience because you're training the muscle to be uh, hypertrophy, to be more resilient. And then the net benefit is actually anti-inflammatory. So it's a paradoxical uh, concept to get your head around, but one that can be applied to uh, fruits and vegetables, but also but also coffee, which I, I'm, I'm happy to hear about. I think it, for me as well is a... Uh there's another interesting theory around something called xenohormesis without yes. us down too many rabbit holes. But I think that could be that that theory is basically that if you eat a food that's benefited from its own hermetic response, so the, the resveratrol in red wine or growing coffee at altitude, by eating that food that's benefited, then you will also benefit because it will have high uh, compounds in itself, which help protect itself from those harsh, con harsh conditions. But then when you eat those com those plants and those drink that coffee, then you also benefit from it. So that's a yeah, interesting theory as well. Definitely. What xenohormesis? I'm going to be looking that up straight away. After David this. Sinclair is big on it. So there you go. <laughs> David Sinclair, who's been on the podcast uh, I've heard it. Yeah. a year and a half ago. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the eight hallmarks of aging. Um, yeah. So this all very much plays in because it's about activating those stress response, those adaptive stress responses that we all have within us inside of us. So whether it is uh, a bit of lack of food, whether it is exercise, whether it is cold shock uh, or whether it is consuming fruits and vegetables that elicit that response, you know, all kind of plays into that. Um, uh, the idea of, of getting to the root cause of what might be causing issues and increasing your resilience, which is amazing. Yeah, and I'll add one thing that doesn't really get discussed in the research much, which mm. is just the, the community social element of coffee, which has got to have arguably the most potent health benefit. You know, you don't get many people having their three to four mugs of coffee in isolation a day. Yeah. So whether they're at the office and they're having a quick coffee break um, or whether it's at home with their partner or family, you know, there is that social element of coffee drinking and tea drinking, obviously, as well, which has to be kind of in the mix here as well yeah definitely it's, it plays into this idea of the coffee paradox that i i only just read about this week as i was preparing for this pod uh, about how it paradoxically raises your blood pressure and it's associated with smoking despite the lower all-cause mortality so yeah i'm sure the community aspect definitely has some part to play in that as well as all the other mechanisms that we discussed mm. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, let's go back into the process. So you've got your coffee with yep. the uh, high amounts of polyphenols. Um, you've reduced uh, the amount of, of the acrylamides. Uh, you're getting to that lovely level. There's another step that you also take. So you, you get your coffee independently lab tested for mm -hmm. environmental pollutants. What, what, where was the, what, why did you do that? Was, is there an issue with, with coffee in general? Or is it, or is it just like another layer of making it the healthiest coffee you can find? <laughs> so we, so yeah, we basically, we tested our coffee for nine different things, independent labs, nine different things. And one of those, so going back to your discussion on the mechanism of coffee, one of those was on the antioxidant capacity of the coffee. And that was kind of like the icing on the cake at the end. And when people talk about our coffee has been healthy because of the antioxidants, I do like to highlight the fact that we also tested it for eight other things. And it's those that gave it that antioxidant capacity. And that's just the only 
mechanism that was easily measurable. So we could have measured lots of other things that were going on if, if we had the, the technology or the, the money to do it. So the other eight things that we tested were initially it was all about focusing on finding a coffee that was highest in the healthy compounds that can be in coffee. But then also on the negative side, we tested for, so we, we chose an organic coffee to begin with, and then we tested it for mycotoxins, for pesticides, for um, heavy metals, for aquatoxin and aflatoxin. Because, and this isn't, um, it's not such a huge issue for everybody, but you know, there are certain people who do have quite a high body burden of say pesticides or, or mm. mycotoxins already, and it is a really big issue for them. Arguably, I'm potentially one of them. Um, but because coffee is, on the pesticide side, coffee is one of the, it's the third most sprayed crop globally with pesticides behind cotton and tobacco. And mm. neither of those ingest. So coffee is, um, yeah, it's heavily treated with mm. pesticides. But, you know, there is some debate as to after the roasting process, how much that ends up in your final coffee. Um, but it is 50-50, the science there. And then on the mycotoxin side, like coffee, a lot of coffee is kind of transported in like hessian sacks. It's not really looked after very well at, uh, from the end-to-end -end process. And another thing that we looked for through our whole process was coffee that's imported in they call them grain pro sacks, which are inside the hessian sack. They're lined with this plastic hermetically sealed sack, which keeps the coffee really fresh and keeps any mycotoxins or anything, any molds out of the coffee. So that was another thing that we added to our list of 45 coffees. It had to be transported in grain pro sacks to keep it really fresh as well. So, so yeah, it's just all about kind of keeping out as much of the bad as possible. But that was kind of, you know, I'd, I'd hate to say that that's, something that everybody should worry about because that's kind of a you know that's it's a minefield and and uh and yeah once you start worrying about those things you really can start getting afraid of food like yeah like totally yeah and i'm glad you brought that up because i think the health anxiety uh of, of food is, is a real thing and i think it's growing because totally. as we get exposed to more information it can be pretty uh, uh anxiety provoking but I think it's also something that we have to have a pragmatic conversation with. And when the science is 50-50, making those choices and actually creating, when you're in the position and you have the responsibility to uh, put something that somebody is going to ingest, um, you know, the, the way and the, the, the method that you're taking to ensure that you're, you're giving a, a top quality product, if it isn't already apparent but at this point, you know, it's, it's very clear and you, you're definitely making the right decision. And you mentioned something there that I wanted to pick up on this concept of body burden. So we had uh, Dr. No, Professor Swam on the podcast a few episodes back talking about the impact of environmental pollutants at large on a number of different um, uh, conditions, one of which uh, is fertility. And I think we definitely need to have uh, more open conversations without, you know, scaremongering about the ways in which we can reduce body burden. And if that is choosing a coffee that has gone through a rigorous process, something that you consume habitually, daily, two times a day, uh, I think that's, you know, something that if you can afford it, uh, it's something to opt into. And then we need to choose a food landscape and actually vote with our pounds as to the kind of quality products that we want to see on our shelves. And I think this is a small step in that direction. Well, it's a large step for, for you guys, but I think in general, I think it's, a, it's definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah, and coffee is a huge part of a lot of people's diets because there aren't many foods or drinks that you would have twice a day or three times a day every single day of your life. So it kind of, it's one of the ones that it is worth choosing a better quality version of because you have so much of it in general. Yeah, totally. I, I, I totally agree with that. So I, I, I can't imagine this whole process would have been very cheap uh, to, to get to this point. So you, you've done your cupping at home, you've got these uh, different plantations, you've watered it down, you've roasted it to, you know, the perfect amount. Uh, what, what was <laughs> what was the next step after that? I mean, how did you come up with the so, name Exhale, first of all? But, so the next step was around the brewing of the coffee, right? Oh, so, okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, so aside from the, 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 what happens at the plantation to then what happens in the roastery, the brewing of the coffee has a huge impact on what finally makes it through to your cup of coffee. And 
There was a 2014 study which tested 104 espressos bought from cafes in Scotland, Italy and Spain. And they found a 31 times difference in the concentration of chlorogenic acid between the highest and lowest. Wow. So 31 times difference. And that's like every stage of the process magnifies that, um, including the brewing process. So the last stage of it um, was to read the research again and try and understand what the theory was and how to brew the healthiest possible cup of coffee. And then that's where then we, we, we kind of we, we tested that theory and sent a, a bag of our coffee down to uh, Dr. Jan at the research lab down in Plymouth and got her to test the antioxidant power of the coffee as well. Wow. Uh, yeah, brewing is a huge <laughs> part as well. So I can to, talk to, about the brewing alone. Yeah, to, let, let's talk a little bit about that actually yeah. with the brewing method because j- just to give some insight into the listener. So I've obviously gone from store-bought coffee to making coffee myself at home and I've used a variety of different um, vessels. So <clears throat> I used to use an Aeropress. I moved to a V60 uh, ceramic one. Uh, and now I've, I've got a, a beautiful espresso machine that I absolutely love uh, sat right next to me <laughs> and uh, I, yeah it just brings me so much joy to have like barista quality coffee whenever I want and it's an investment but certainly something that's going to pay off because I don't need to go to a coffee store to enjoy I'll go there for the communal benefits obviously Alex but I'll go I'll go for uh, I'll, I'll stick with my, my habitual um, coffee a day for my own machine but so, so talk to us about the different brewing methods and how that might impact the benefits as well as the flavor of, of the coffee yeah so I guess going back to how you um, originally brewed your coffee using the the drippers and the filter papers so the kind of the most obvious um, one is the, clear, the, the, the clearest differentiator between brewing methods is that if you use a paper filter to brew your coffee, whatever it is, whether it's a Chemex, a dripper, a V60, or an AeroPress with a paper filter, that paper filter removes up to 98% of the cafestol and cowiol from the coffee. So these two really healthy compounds because they're- the oils, right? Yeah, exactly. They're fat soluble, they're in the oils and the, the paper removes those oils from the coffee. So if you're using a, paper filter in your coffee then um then you're not going to get the benefit of the calf song cow wheel mm. paradoxically <laughs> as as with everything with coffee um it is those oils and the calf song cow wheel which have been associated with uh coffee causing a slight increase and in spike in your cholesterol levels which is one of the reasons why coffee was bad mouth in the in the first mm. place but then that also plays into the whole paradox of coffee and that coffee can cause a temporary spike in cholesterol, but then actually, if you look at the epidemiology, coffee is associated with a reduced risk of all of the, the diseases that you would relate to that, like coronary heart disease, uh, cardiovascular disease, sorry. So actually long-term it seems to benefit, but short-term you get some kind of spike in cholesterol. Anyway, that's off on a slightly di- different tangent. Um, uh, so yeah. it's, it's similar to the impact on blood pressure, I guess, as well, because exactly. it can it will increase your blood pressure in the short term, but overall it's re- related to reduced all-cause uh, cardiovascular uh, issues. So Exactly. So back to the brewing. So if you use a V60, you can get steel V60s. Um, yeah. And also if you use an AeroPress, you can use a steel AeroPress. Um, but then if you're kind of like a good old cafetiere drinker or something like that, there are ways that you can tweak your brewing method to make that healthier itself. So brewing coffee is a chemical reaction. Like any other chemical reaction, the amount of polyphenols that leave the beans and are absorbed into the cup of coffee is affected by certain variables. So things like temperature speeds up a reaction. So if you brew your cafetiere with a slightly hotter temperature than usual, you're, that's gonna speed up the reaction and the extraction of the polyphenols and get a, high, a healthier cup of coffee. The grind size of the coffee is really important. So if you use a finer grind size of coffee, the coffee has a larger surface area, which means also a more efficient reaction and a more efficient extraction of polyphenols. And then finally, the amount of time that the coffee is in contact with the water. So if you would normally brew your cafetiere for three to four minutes, if you add an extra minute, maybe do four to five minutes, you're likely to extract more polyphenols as well. So there's lots of ways you can tweak whatever your favorite brew method is, stick with that brew method, and then just tweak that to make it more optimized, basically. That's epic. So so it, <laughs> explaining it down for, for the listener who just wants to go and buy a coffee 
and uh, and know that it's the healthiest uh, method of brewing to maximize the potential benefits. What 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 should they go in order? <laughs> You know what, I would not, I, I would say that the healthiest possible way to brew coffee is the way that you enjoy drinking it the most. Oh, uh, <laughs> political <laughs> answer. <laughs> because of the immense joy that drinking coffee brings, I, we don't want to get in the way of that at all. Yeah, so yeah. What, what I always say is whatever your favourite way of brewing coffee is, just tweak it to make it healthier or more optimised, basically, using that those the earlier principles I mentioned. Alex, what, 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 how do you take your coffee? It's just black, yeah. Just black, so I've got, okay. I've got a nice filter, um, and I just go that way. But um, just going back to what Al said as well, you know, it's worth highlighting that most of this research is done on like ordinary bog standard coffee. Mm. So again, it doesn't have to be some sort of idealistic brewing method, etc. Like you're getting this from um, bog standard. So then the question becomes, what are you getting from a, a, a cherry picked, so to speak, um, coffee bean? Yeah. But one thing to add on the brewing, a paper I saw this morning was around um, the water that you use. Mm. And that um, sort of mineral rich water can have bind some of these polyphenols and reduce their presence in your coffee brew. Oh. Um, so that was quite an interesting finding. A reduce the presence. Yeah. How oh, interesting. That's so, because- No idea. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I heard about this company. I don't know if they still exist. They were looking for funding a couple of years ago, but they were called Third Wave Water. And I think they actually had minerals, uh, like a mineral sachet that you add to your water to give a little bit more flavor to the coffee that you consume. Um, I, I don't know what minerals they had in it, but uh, I, I, that's, that's super interesting. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure what the takeaway message is, you know, <laughs> you don't necessarily want to just be using tap water either. Um, yeah. anyone where I mean, maybe the takeaway message is that coffee, actually, you don't need to add minerals to the water because coffee does have a lot of these things in it itself yeah. as well. So aside from all of these polyphenols and plant phytochemicals in the coffee, we also tested it for certain vitamins as well. And vitamin B3, for example, two cups of our coffee provides... 20% of your RDA of vitamin B3, which is makes it one of the highest natural sources in our diets behind meat. So you don't need it from the water, you're getting it all from the coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, what, what about milk? What, a lot of people have milk in the diet, obviously oat milk, almond milk is super popular. Does that impact the, the, the health benefits at all? Yeah, so I think I wasn't aware of this until quite recently, but there is some evidence indicating that it can. Um, but again, it seems to be a bit mixed. So um, there is research indicating that if you add milk to your coffee, it will, um, again, prevent some of the absorption of these polyphenols. Um, it isn't unanimous. Um, so again, I would probably go back to Al's point of, you know, if you enjoy adding milk and you don't enjoy a black coffee, don't stress about it. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And also the type of milk. So we, you know, we are, I have this big dream of hopefully going back to Dr. Jan at the antioxidant lab and getting her to test our coffee brewed with lots of different types of milk to then see which, how that impacts the, um, the different types of milk impact the antioxidant capacity of the coffee. But at the end of the day, ultimately, if people want milk in their coffee, they'll choose it based on their own dietary requirements. Yeah. And, you know, so it's kind of a, a hard one for us to advise what people should do um because that people have their own kind of almost dogmatic beliefs on on milk yeah yeah no totally and i think um if you are going to do that you should do it with different types of water as well after what we've just heard mm -hmm. that that would be really Definitely. interesting to see and, yeah. and certainly like uh put that out there for people because i love the, the 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 scientific approach you guys are taking uh to figuring out what the the how best to uh, create coffee and how best to you know uh, consume it as well um, within mm. you know the the realms of what people choose to do and what they find most pleasurable. Um, yeah, but it would be really interesting to, so to I, see. I'd say that, on that point, we've definitely not chosen the easiest or most straightforward <laughs> to do, yeah. and that's where kind of something we were discussing earlier, which is where. You know, what we've chosen to do here is we've chosen to take one ingredient, coffee, which is is naturally can be really rich in all of these things you know, and, mm. and work with what's naturally in it and work with retaining as much of those healthy compounds as possible and develop as many as possible as well. Whereas the easy thing to do and what the current trend in coffee is, is to take a really low quality coffee, an instant coffee 
then pump it full of whatever the latest fad superfoods are. Yeah. Adding like up to 10 different ingredients into your coffee and then you kind of rebadge it and call it healthy because it's yeah. the easiest thing to do. Whereas we, we've decided to work with one ingredient and just like maximize the inherent kind of beauty of that one ingredient. And it's kind yeah. of, it's, it's reflective of what happens a lot across the, the health and wellness and, and food industry as well. And it's kind of, it's just the easier option is just to add things to it and, yeah, we. I, I, I agree. I, I I have this kind of gripe with the wellness industry in general, right? So as soon as a food is deemed to be the healthiest, whether it's watermelon, whether it's uh, kale or whatever, you know, all of a sudden you have uh, extracts of of kale like, like sprinkled onto some like deep fried chips, and suddenly that becomes like a healthy crisp. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And or like, you know, uh, you look at a green drink and it's like got kale in it and you read it and it's like 5% kale, 50% apple juice, which is just pure sugar and it's going to mainline to your liver. So, you know, I'm not I'm not saying that to scaremonger or to, to give people that anxiety about the foods that they consume, but I think we need to be more aware of that. And, it, and what you're what you're um you you're tapping into there is this trend that I've seen where you have coffee and an adaptogen or nootropic or whatever the you know latest terminology that they're using beautifully designed well branded looks super healthy you know proposed benefits of ashwagandha or you know it, bilbao jinko whatever um probably wouldn't want jinko with coffee but uh, but uh, um that's uh you know that that's certainly a trend uh, i think yeah. and, and, and it's just don't I, I'm, I'm hoping that pe- particularly listeners to the podcast that I, I think uh are really um, clued up as to how to navigate labels. But in general, I think there is also a trend to being a lot more conscious as a consumer. So you can actually recognize, okay, this is actually a quality product because they've gone through all these different layers of uh, whether it's testing or whether it's, you know, B Corp status or whether it's whatever uh, to, to guarantee that, you know, there's, there's a lot of purpose behind it. It's not just a, 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 the, the fad. Yeah, and I, I just think you don't need to. So like a lot of these things people are adding to coffee to say, um, for example, coffee gives you coffee with X, uh, with this adaptogen on medicinal mushroom in it will give you more energy. But actually all you need is the caffeine. If you want energy from your coffee, the caffeine is going to give you all the energy you need. You don't need <laughs> any more energy than that. And then on the same on the health side and they're kind of adding things in to give you a more restful night's sleep and around uh, the health promoting effect. But like, you know, the antioxidants of coffee, like uh, like one, our, our test was that one brewed cup of our coffee had the same antioxidants as 12 punnets of blueberries or 55 mm-hmm. oranges in one cup of coffee. So why would you need more than that kind of on, on that level? And it's kind of, it's just, it's all there in coffee already and it's all there yeah. in your food already. You just need to work with what's naturally in it. Alex, I wanted to ask you actually, because we've kind of neglected the people who don't, who can't have caffeine in the diet or they have a, an, a, an erroneous effect. Um, what, what are the differences between people being able to tolerate caffeinated beverages? Um, and, uh, and can you achieve similar health benefits from, uh, health benefits from a, a decaffeinated coffee, whatever coffee you choose to consume? Um, is, uh, yeah, maybe we can talk a bit about that because I, I feel like I, I've just come off a coffee fast for 30 days. I do this once a, a year because I want to retain my sensitivity to caffeine because I, I love the kick that it gets, but I also want to like experiment and see what the impact of regular consumption is having on my sleep uh, and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about my experiences in a second, but m- maybe you can talk a bit about that. Yeah. So to the second question first, most of the research shows us um, that decaf coffee has the same health benefits. So you can um, have your decaf three to four mugs a day if you wanted to, that's gonna provide you very similar, if not the same, reduced risk of all the conditions that we spoke about earlier. Um, In regards to the difference between someone who sort of tolerates caffeine better than someone else, Mm. there is the genetic piece to the puzzle. Um, So the CYP1A2 gene variants of that will influence the activity of enzymes that are metabolizing caffeine. So it's generally said that you're either a slow or a fast metabolizer Um, and that's related to the rate at which you metabolize caffeine so a slow metabolizer is gonna have caffeine lingering in their bloodstream for longer and therefore they may be the person that has a coffee at midday and is still wide awake at 10 p.m kind of thing 
Yeah. Um, whereas so some just, just to clarify that, so that's if you express less of the CYP1A2 gene, is that is that right? Um, it is, yes. So the CYP1A2 gene is going to obviously then impact the enzymes that are metabolizing the caffeine. Mm. Um, so it's not black or white, I would say, you know, I've heard people before talk about if you take someone who's never had caffeine, obviously that they don't really exist, but if you were to theoretically have that person um, and they, their capacity to metabolize might be quite different to someone who's a, um, or a fast metabolizer who's just got, um, who's accommodated to their caffeine intake, because obviously it does blunt, we get used to caffeine and it doesn't have the same impact, hence your fast, for example. So there are other kind of bits, other pieces to the puzzle there as well. Um, your day-to-day -day stresses are gonna impact the, the caffeine and the coffee because it's in having an impact on your sympathetic nervous system. So, you know, I know that I respond differently to my cup of coffee in the morning based on my sleep quality that week, let's for example, or just how stressed I am day to day, yeah. exercise, anything that's impacting the same systems that coffee and caffeine is impacting, we have to kind of bear that in mind as well. Um, there are studies that have looked at this and in at least healthy individuals who are regular coffee drinkers, who are, um, I think they were students as well, but they were having a coffee in a, a non-stressful environment and cortisol levels didn't change. So mm. you know, think of the stress response and most people go to cortisol, but actually that stayed perfectly normal. However, there were markers associated with the sympathetic nervous system that showed that that part of your stress response is getting upregulated. Um, so if you've already got someone who is like sympathetically driven, they're in that stress response for whatever reason, you're kind of putting a bit of fuel on the fire. Um, and therefore, again, decaf might be a more sensible option from that perspective. Gotcha. Okay. And so that's really good news uh, for a lot of people, <laughs> I think, because they can enjoy decaf uh, and still have the benefits as well. And yeah. I think that explains a lot because I, I, I'm, I can't remember what my DNA um, results demonstrated, but purely from intuition, I know <clears throat> if I if I have coffee after twelve, my sleep is significantly impacted. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, after uh, after my coffee fast, I was I was literally looking through all my numbers because I tracked my I tracked my sleep for about three years now, um, and I could definitely see that there was a huge impact on my deep sleep and my REM sleep, which went up by twenty percent across the board when I switched from caffeinated to decaffeinated. And so what that's, when I go back to caffeinated, which I did just now, so I've just had my first coffee about an hour ago with you guys, um, I'm definitely gonna be having it far earlier than I've been having right now. So instead of before 12, I'm gonna experiment with before 10, uh, 10 a.m. Um, just having my one or two cups per day and just see what that impact has on my sleep. And I think, you know, the, the more integrated we, we become, well, the, the, the more accessible tools uh, become to us where we can actually look at parameters of health like sleep quality cortisol levels um, microbiome tests hopefully um, that's I, I think going to be a real driver towards behavioral change that has community benefits so um, yeah super interesting to, to understand why people have differences yeah and going back to your kind of intuitiveness um, the research kind of indicates that we do generally just draw to that genetic predisposition. So those who drink lots of coffee generally are fast metabolizers. Mm. Like it's almost like the body just knows. Yeah. Um, so yes, the genetic testing is super interesting, but you can probably tell by your just natural inclination for coffee consumption. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And it's really interesting to note that about the sympathetic drive as well and, and how that has an impact. I was going to ask, actually, not too much is well known about this, but um, just uh, this week, Tim Spector was talking about coffee on social media. And uh, another one, I, I feel like I'm just plugging all the previous guests from the podcast. He's been on the podcast as well about a year ago. Um, uh, do, do we know what the impact is of 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 coffee on uh, on the microbiota and whether that impacts the gut brain axis at all well there's um 
it's early days, I think is the mm. best way to describe it, but we definitely do have some research. And in fact, there's a quote that I pulled out this morning that kind of talks about how not only will your genome determine sort of the bioavailability of kind of coffee metabolites, but your microbiota will as well. Mm. So obviously there's this kind of unfortunate situation whereby the consumption of these sort of polyphenols can act as prebiotic um, to the gut microbiota. We see increases in bifido and lactobacillus um, in animal and human studies. Um, but the health of your microbiota or microbiome um, influences your ability to metabolize these polyphenols into healthier compounds, if that makes right. sense. Mm. So the healthier the gut, the more you're able to actually benefit from these things as well. Mm. Um, so there's lots of other things apart from that kind of prebiotic element when it comes to coffee. Um, the fact that we've discussed coffee having antioxidant properties kind of comes into the gut. Um, the anti-inflammatory properties can potentially have an impact here as well. Um, we mentioned that coffee has uh, a reduced risk from a colon cancer perspective, um, but it also has pro-motility effects. You know, 30% mm. of coffee consumers will have a poo soon yeah. after coffee. Yeah. Um, so for some people that can actually be really helpful. And I do, I kind of wonder whether that has an impact on sort of the Parkinson's element, because, you know, anyone yeah. who listened to a podcast or read a book around Parkinson's knows that constipation can manifest 10 to 20 years before the actual diagnosis. So if we're, if we're able to maintain a healthy microbiota and have, you know, a regular bowel movement, which really should be one to three bowel movements a day seems to be the norm, um, then these are all having multiple effects on all of the other conditions that we've um, discussed because mm. as we most of us now know the gut is integral to cardiometabolic health to liver health kidney health you know we talk about all of these gut something axes i saw a paper yesterday which was about the gut eye axis <laughs> really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but we've got gut bone gut lung gut skin gut brain yeah. obviously um, there was a a study that it kind of looked at the gut brain axis, but I don't think it looked at it sort of, it's hard to look at, I think. Yeah. Axis. I mean, for those people that don't really know what it refers to, it's four pathways that connect the gut and the brain. So there's a, a hormonal pathway where we can use the example of cortisol, but there are plenty of other hormones obviously as well. There's a metabolic pathway. So metabolites from our microbiome, like short chain fatty acids and butyrate, which is a product of the fermentation of fibers. Butyrate has immunomodulatory, anti-inflammatory, cognitive, neurological benefits. Um, there's a neurological pathway, so the vagus nerve, for example. So mm -hmm. um, metabolites are able to influence the vagus nerve and kind of travel up into the central nervous system. And there's an immune pathway. So this takes us to kind of pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory cytokines and other immune modulating compounds. So we've got four pathways or four highways that kind of innovate the two. Mm. And interestingly, the vast majority of information is going gut to brain, like 90% is going gut to brain, 10% is going brain to gut, which in itself is kind of mind boggling. Yeah. Um, but because the microbiome and the metabolites of the microbiome, which are influenced by coffee and the polyphenols, that's one of the ways that it could possibly impact the gut brain axis. Chlorogenic acid has anti-anxiety properties. So a lot of the feedback that Exhale get is people who haven't been able to tolerate coffee, caffeinated coffee, seem to be able to tolerate it better. Mm. But chlorogenic acid has also been shown to improve sleep. So having maybe a decaf exhale in the evening to actually support your sleep would be an interesting thing to track with the aura ring, maybe. Mm, yeah. Um, Obviously, we've already mentioned the study showing that in healthy, regular coffee drinkers, cortisol was an influence. So cortisol is a hormone that is discussed within the gut brain axis. Um, and then I guess just thinking about kind of the Alzheimer's, the fact that coffee reduces depression, um, that's again, you could tie in really with the gut brain axis ultimately. Um, mm. So there is research and kind of mechanisms we're aware of. Um, but not a huge amount at this point. I think it's probably going to be an area that explodes just because of the popularity of coffee and the popularity of the gut brain axis. Gut brain axis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I always come back to this paper um, or a series of papers that came out of Quark 
looking at the impact of the gut microbiota uh, on the polyphenols that you find in berries. And they looked at, um, they tend to look at subjects with uh, ileostomies. Um, so for the user, that's where you have a, a stoma, uh, which is formed because somebody's had a part of their bowel removed. Um, and they looked at the metabolites of the polyphenols that they found in berries and they're acted on by the bugs and to create different types of chemicals that all have different properties that are in line with the similar sort of uh, categories that we just talked about, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is super interesting. And I imagine something similar with all that density of polyphenols is happening with, with coffee as well. Um, on the subject of decaf, I, I do want to ask about the different methods of decaffeination because, uh, Al, am, am I right in thinking that there is some caffeine left in it uh, and there are, there, are, there are different ways of decaffeinating, some good, some bad. Uh, the, what is your take on that? Yeah, so the kind of traditional methods of decaffeinated, decaffeinating coffee use chemicals. Um, so there's some, there's a few types of chemicals which are quite nasty that were used. Um, methylene chloride um, was used once upon a time and formaldehyde, the byproduct of this. So um, decaf got a bit of a bad rep over the years, but then more recently, there's been some, a few of the methods that have emerged. The Swiss water method is the, the kind of the, the most famous one, which is chemical free and uses only water. Um, but then our coffee is decaffeinated by another one, which is also relatively new, um, called the mountain water process. And it uses nothing but the, the purest spring water from the highest mountain in Mexico, the Pico de Orizaba, and nothing else. And the beans are, the be because caffeine's water soluble, the beans are soaked in this spring water, uh, and then the caffeine leaves the beans, and then the, the into, and it, it enters the water, and then the water's filtered to remove the caffeine from it. And then I think the beans are soaked back in the water. To, so somehow they, they reabsorb the other things that are lost as well. So, um, but then it takes apparently 99.9% .9 of the caffeine from the coffee, the mountain water process anyway. I'm not too sure about the other methods, but mm -hmm. yeah. And also as well as that, so it takes away a lot more of the, the caffeine, but also the process leaves more of the polyphenols intact. Whereas the... Uh -huh chemical processes leach out something like up to 16% of the chlorogenic acid from the coffee. So yeah. Yeah, lots of level on lots of levels, you want to avoid the chemical processes. Yeah. And I guess like 16% doesn't sound like that much, but that's just at the start of the process. And then you've got all the other processes that will jet gradually degrade exactly. your polyphenol exactly. content as well. Exactly. So yeah. And we were just really lucky with this particular plantation in Mexico that, um, that one that was the, the best of the 45 that actually they um, had a decaffeination plant near them and they decaffeinated it. So our, our regular coffee is exactly the same as our decaf coffee. They're all the same coffee. So for people who are slightly more sensitive to caffeine, going back to an earlier topic, what we've started doing in our house, doing in our house is because I'm a slow metabolizer of cough caffeine in the afternoon. If I really need a coffee, I might have a half calf. I might mix half caffeinated and half decaf. Ah. To get a little bit of a effect from the caffeine, but not enough so it will keep me up at night. So yeah. and they work yeah. really well together because they're the same coffee basically. Uh, that's that's a good little trick. I will mm -hmm. I will experiment with that myself actually for <laughs> sure. Having a half cap, I like that. And you, you use a do you use a cafetiere? Is that is that your method? Um so first thing every morning I wait start the day with a double espresso I think it's <laughs> kind of it's become my ritual. I love the espresso machine. I got one about the same time as you and it's become a real ritual and that that kind of almost the double espresso signifies it's an early start to the day generally i'm up this morning i was up at five double espresso and that kind of signals let's get the day going let's get ready let's go for a run let's get some work done let's kind of you know make make stuff happen <laughs> um and then after that i'll have some cafetiers or an aeropress and just kind of yeah I'll, that the, the fun bit about coffee is a variety of all the different brewing methods and we have about 15 different brewing methods so we just have a, a play around really yeah that's epic i mean I, alex i was going to ask you actually about um this is great for me because i'm having all my questions answered about <laughs> <laughs> coffee this is this is my favorite episode yeah. um, so i have my coffee um an hour and a half after i wake so i wake up fairly early 
And uh, usually after about 20 minutes, you know, I've done my meditation, my morning hygiene, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, I feel kind of awake anyway. I have this spring of energy. And I guess that correlates with the diurnal variation of uh, different hormones like cortisol that will get you started for the day. And then I, I choose to have my coffee an hour and a half later because I, I understand it has an impact on your cortisol levels. Do you recommend that as a way of consuming coffee or is it okay to have your coffee first thing in the morning like my fiance does? As soon as she wakes up, she tells me I need a coffee and I know you make her the coffee and whatever, whatever. Uh, but yeah, so do, do, you, do you have any thoughts on, on that as it pertains to the sympathetic nervous system? Um, so I know that there is a study that looked at sleep deprivation, like one night of sleep deprivation and not up all night, but to disturb sleep. And if you have a coffee first thing in the morning before breakfast compared to having it after breakfast, from a blood sugar perspective, you're going to be on more of a roller coaster ride. So the quality of your sleep may impact the timing or the optimal timing of your coffee in the morning. So arguably, and again, that's this is the paradox because um, coffee consumers have a reduced risk of diabetes. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> so there's kind of like the short term and the long term and they don't always match up obviously so I think you know sensibly if you want to have your best productivity cognitively physically and you haven't had the best night's sleep maybe have it post breakfast um, I my preference for my training I pray me just lift heavy stuff off the floor a few times I don't run 100 miles um, is first thing in the morning I like yeah. it right now with a 10 month old but that's like my dream. If I could get up, go to the gym, I would have my coffee in the morning beforehand. So I'd get up, shower, um, have a coffee, get to the gym. And I did some 24 seven blood glucose monitoring and it didn't impact my blood sugar at all. I was really surprised. I, th I was expecting it to both impact blood sugar, but also with the exercise potentially just creating a stress response influencing blood sugar levels, but it really didn't. Mm. Um, so there is, I think, some personal responses here as well. Um, but I think most importantly, in my experience, coffee in the first thing in the morning is just so much nicer yeah. than coffee <laughs> later in the day. So it really, like, it's just for me, I, I love it. So even if it was having a, a suboptimal impact, I'm still going to choose it from a, a preferential perspective. Yeah, I think that's really important to keep in mind of as well. And that, uh, I don't know what it is. Is it? it might be because your palate has been exposed to a number of different products uh, for the first three, four hours of your day, if you choose to have breakfast then. But yeah. my first coffee in the morning tastes so much better, like at least like 30, 40% better than my <laughs> one at like 11, 11.30. And I, I, I'm really, I, I'm glad, I haven't said this out loud, so I'm glad someone else is having this experience as well, because I just oh. thought it was me. <laughs> no, what I would say is what you can do if you prefer to drink your coffee kind of first thing before eating is what I do is I do have that double espresso first thing, but I'll have a glass of water before. So I'll try and have like half an hour before the espresso, like half a pint of water with some kind of pinch of Himalayan sea salt and a few other bits that I put in it. And then that kind of water's hydrated me already. And then I'll have the double espresso a little bit later and I still get that effect from the, the kind of the coffee on an empty stomach, basically. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I always drink uh, a good half a litre of water like yeah. first thing in the morning with all my supplements and stuff. Although a lot of people can't have supplements on an empty stomach, but I, I can I tend to fare okay with that. Um, I, I, I think we've done a lot. <laughs> we've, <laughs> talked, we've talked about every element of coffee that I tend to get asked about, the you know, caffeination, whether decaf is the same, the polyphenol content, all that kind of stuff. The last bit I wanted to talk about was really brainstorming ideas for uh a healthy coffee uh future and what that looks like actually for for the brand and and actually you know one thing that um i think uh, a lot of people will notice is when you go to a coffee store uh it's not a particularly healthy experience despite the presence of coffee in coffee stores so you usually offered something very sweet next to it uh, you know, you have these like energy bars, which are basically pure sugar. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's not a very well-rounded experience. So if you were to, to really reimagine the experience of coffee as a pure, as a, as a, as a healthier one, what would that look like? Uh, whether that's a cafe or, you know, something like grand, like a restaurant, 
um, whilst maintaining sort of like the pleasurable, flavorful aspect that obviously you, you take very seriously too. I have to say, I think <clears throat> I think the specialty coffee industry is most of the way there already. If you go mm -hmm. in any specialty coffee shop across the country, really, they've already gone through the process of swapping out most of their foods there and everything is kind of like, you know, <clears throat> sugar-free, gluten-free, it's got this extra in it and they're really healthy you know, ranges of salads that they're selling for their lunch. They kind of like the gone are the days of like a bog standard sandwich in a cafe. So like specialist coffee world is is there almost already. The only thing left to change is the coffee. So literally <laughs> the only thing that the only thing that a health food cafe doesn't have, it seems, is a healthy coffee. Like or, or one that's been kind of like yeah put prioritized for health. So so that's where I guess is the that's the future of cafes is to adopt for more of them to adopt the speciality cafe model but with a with a focus on the coffee as well which is their bread and butter really so yeah no definitely definitely and what what would uh like if excel were to do a, a cafe that's what i'm angling for here um <laughs> what, what 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 would that look like to you i mean like what, what other elements do you think you should adopt to, i mean you've already got you know the different uh, flavors of coffee the decaffeinated one like what, what else is is sort of in your in your list of things yeah i mean look i think the obvious choice for the, the kind of the kitchen side of the cafe would obviously be the, the doctor's kitchen uh, <laughs> 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 i mean he does actually it's basically what i pitched as the idea to you a few months ago where <laughs> we were actually based out of a, a bouldering center in walthamstow so we have a couple of private offices in this uh this bouldering centre, climbing centre, and they have a cafe there. And the cafe is just, it's the stunning, stunningly designed cafe. It's overlooking the climbing walls. Um, it's a really healthy, active kind of vibe in there. Um, and for me, the ideal there would have been like a ah, kind of healthy coffee, but then also like a, a kitchen serving the kind of doctor's kitchen type food as well. And it just, the environment, the food, the coffee, like all of that would be a kind of a, a, a dream, whether it's now or in the future, but that's the, perfect outcome for me for this yeah yeah no I, I see it and i would love to do something like that i think in the future i've been asked so many times to do some form of cafe uh and uh, i i would love to do that and actually create food that is optimized from the quantity of vegetables the the different type of uh, uh research benefits that we've put into the app as well so all that kind of stuff but flowing through the different options that you have so you have a a beautiful balanced flavorful meal uh, that you know is is doing good for you and then uh, great coffee uh, as well you could pretty so much give great. some you could give a, the chef your app and just say there you go just just cook anything on the top <laughs> yeah. that would be like the ideal kitchen side of things <laughs> um, yeah. but no that yeah one day in the future maybe yeah definitely yeah that would be amazing um but guys we, we've chatted uh for well over an hour about coffee uh i, I think uh, i think we've done it with, with coffee but um this is great honestly this is amazing i think if anyone has any follow-up questions uh i'll just direct them to you and your socials and and where you can get uh, the products and stuff but um this has been brilliant uh i just want to say thank you amazing